So let's start with customer use case number one, protecting a large SaaS provider. And I'm sure you'll appreciate for the work that we do, we do actually struggle to get quite often the name of the provider or customer we're working with because they don't want to publicly admit what they were doing before wasn't quite that good. So I can tell you that this is an extremely large SaaS provider of a name I can't say, but the challenge they had is in protecting a 20,000 VM environment. Now, so were they down a month and a half ago? They weren't down a month and a half. It's not those guys. <laughs> okay. But maybe we should talk to those guys. Although from what I gather, I, I don't believe they're virtualized. Just a rumor I might have heard. So of course, 20,000 VM environment, that's not going to be one vCenter. You guys know a lot more on scaling vCenter than I do with the multiple vCDXs. It's a pod-based architecture based on vSphere 6, and they have 10 pods. Eight for the customer VMs and two for management as per a decent design best practice. And these are split 50-50 between production and, and DR for the very simple reason that if you're a SaaS provider, you can't run in a degraded state in the DR site. It's just as good as down if every customer is fighting for the same resource. So to draw this reasonably simple architecture out, we've got the four customer pods, we have our management pod, and the exact same infrastructure between the sites. Now, these per pod are pretty big. So they have one petabyte of storage, as we can see there, 64 ESXi hosts per pod. They are split into eight clusters, so eight hosts per cluster. Each host has 256 gig of RAM, and then the link between these data centers is, as you can expect, reasonably meaty. It's a 10 gig link, and it is in the US, and it's stretched out over around 500 miles. Won't say where, don't want anyone Googling and finding out exactly who this is, but 10 gig, it's actually more than 500 miles, but again, I don't want to give the exact figure. So, in this environment, what were they doing before Zerto? They were doing, as you'd expect, traditional storage-based replication between the one petabyte of storage arrays for each of the pods. Now, they have multiple customers, the average customer has just one VM that gives them their application. It's the entire stack in one VM. They do have a smaller percentage of customers that have a couple of VMs in their stack. But one key requirement for this SaaS provider was the ability to not only fail over the entire pod or all of the pods, but recover individual customers. If they need to recover individual customers and you're doing storage replication, that meant They have one LUN per customer. Is it in individual customers or individual VMs for the customers? Both. Okay. But predominantly one customer. Right. Usually it's a logical failure. Usually it's a combined VM, so it's one in the same. If so, they only had VVOLs. If they only had VVOLs. And if VVOLs did replication. Yes. <laughs> and if the storage vendor support the VVOLs, which it doesn't. And the replication. Yes. Yeah. So that makes it 2020, so we, they went to you. <laughs> So if you've got one LUN per customer and you've got eight hosts per pod, what's the maximum number of LUNs that you can present to all of the ESXi hosts in that cluster? In a vSphere 6. 254. 254? Or is it 256? One or the other. say it's 255. Yeah? It's an 8-bit number, but It depends it's whether you've got a CD-ROM drive and what you boot from. Okay, so we'll take 255 as a, a reasonable figure here. So if you extrapolate that out and then say, but you also need orchestration and automation, so they have Site Recovery Manager on top of this, what's the maximum number of protection groups in SRM v6? And I'm not expecting anyone to know, I can tell you. It's okay? Five. It's 250. So even though so that goes to 255, 250. So if you've got a maximum 250 <coughs> LUNs per cluster and you extrapolate that down for each one of these, what's the maximum number of VMs per pod? Or customers per pod, sorry. And what's the maximum number of VMs across all the sites? 2,000 customers per pod, 8,000 client VMs and 2,000 of your own VMs. 3,000 per pod? Should we check? Eight times 250. Yeah. 2,000. So this is why I have my calculator, because I don't trust even that. That's it. Well, assuming, assuming you never use 2,000. 
2000. Well, assuming you never use vMotion. vMotion within the cluster, but not across clusters. Yeah, well, that's the point. Anyway, <coughs> so we all agree. That's still a rounding number. Storage based replication, 250 there. That's going to be a theoretical maximum of 8,000 customers. Correct? Okay. Now, for a no. cloud provider servicing hundreds of thousands of potential yeah, customers. It, it's not that good. It's not that good. I agree. Because it's 254 LUNs per cluster, not per host. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, not That's that why good. I was wondering why the, the cluster size was quite small. Mm -hmm. Eight, eight hosts in a cluster is <clears throat> tiny. So, yeah. Thanks. So, they've got it as small as they can given the requirements that they have, but they're now hampered by the limit on the number of maximum ho uh, LUNs that you can present to a host, and therefore you've got to present that LUN to all the hosts in the cluster. They should use NFS. They can't do that. It's not supported by the storage vendor. Oh. So, they're in a pickle because this IT team is fighting for the right to host this infrastructure. They have a separate team. The separate team wants to build this in a public cloud. You've got to drive the maximum efficiency from the investment you've made here to compete with these new technologies, to compete with these commodities of scale. This is not a, a, a unique battle for this customer. This is something that you now have to do in multiple virtualization projects. Justify how we can do it ourselves and how we can do it better, cheaper, and faster, and why we should do it in-house. So this customer, with this use case, came to us and said, can you help us? We need to improve from this configuration. So we said, of course, yes. So what I want to do is layer on, on top of this, how we then factor Zerto into this environment. So each one of these pods has its own vCenter. And the management pod itself has its own vCenter, a vCenter to manage the vCenters. So in the bottom pod here, we'll call it VC, we have five vCenters here. And we have five vCenters here. Need complete redundancy on all the components. The next thing we have is Zerto. So Zerto has a Zerto virtual manager. It's our central management interface that gives you, one, something to log into to initiate, manage, and recover. And two, it's what plugs into the vCenter to orchestrate and automate all the operations. These are a one-to-one -one mapping. So you have one per vCenter, so we have five of these. Now these had to be spec'd and, and sized according to the number of protected virtual machines. We have a sizing guide. So even though it is just a simple .NET service, in this size environment, we recommend it have its own SQL database. And the ZVM spec was six vCPU, 12 gig of RAM, and around 100 gig of disk space for the logging, the data, the information. So that was a ZVM spec, but these are just the management. What about the actual replication itself? So for that, we have our virtual replication appliances. And these are deployed one per ESXi host that you're replicating from and to. So at that point, you're thinking, well, that's 64 hosts per pod, Joshua. That's quite a lot of replication appliances. What is the overhead of this on the environment? So the VRAs, for this customer and the sizing, they're two vCPU. That's so they can maintain the highest level compression of the data. We're still going with four gig of RAM. You can go higher, but they actually don't need to. They're going to start with four gig. And if they find, once it's in full deployment, that they hit issues there, then you can always up that on the fly. They use 12 gig of disk space and one static IP. So if you factor this out, given the size of the ESXi host memory, you deploy one replication appliance to all the ESXi hosts, then it comes to around 1.56% of the total cluster memory. They're very small. And the beauty of having one per host is that it's a scale-out architecture. I have te techies come to me and say, when are you going to move away from having one appliance per host? I say, never. That's the beauty of it. Because what happens is when you deploy the VRAs, to each of the hosts 
And by the way, you can fully automate this process via the REST API. You don't have to sit there and click one by one. Nobody's going to do that in this scale environment. This replication is point to point. So pod one to pod one, pod two to pod two. So rather than having one storage device here and one storage device here, and that one storage device trying to send all of those protected VMs to the recovery site, we've got multiple streams. We've got multiple TCP sessions. So you're spreading the load of all this replication traffic to fully utilize. It's only 500 miles. Yeah. To fully utilize this 10 gig link to maintain the lowest recovery point objective possible. Because the one thing we saw in the other recent SaaS provider outage where there was data loss is as soon as you have data loss in a SaaS service, then that's not good for PR. So not good for customers either. Not good for customers, not good for PR. The problem, the problem with data loss in a software as a service environment is nobody knows what data was lost. Exactly. <coughs> so key report and requirement is maximizing the use of this link to maintain the lowest recovery point objective on the replicated data, which this <laughs> scale out architecture is going to allow. And this is all IP based. You can put it on completely segregated networks to split out the load. You're, of course, going to have a separate replication network. Each of the replication appliances has its own built-in compression to minimize the utilization of the link of that replicated data. And at this point, the next question is going to be, OK, so let's say, for example, I protect the entire environment with Zerto. What happens if there's an issue with Zerto? How do you protect what's protecting me? And that is a genuinely good question at this sort of scale. So, in order to counter that, the first thing to say is that the Zerto Virtual Manager is like a vCenter. If a vCenter is offline, maybe it's rebooting on a different ESXi host, do any of the VMs stop on any of the hosts? No, they just carry them running. Exactly the same with the Zerto Manager. All of the VRAs carry on functioning. All of the replication traffic is continuing. You just don't have the ability to access, oh, sorry, to access the management infrastructure for that site. So first of all, these are in the management pod. That's its own HA cluster. If one of the hosts dies, they're all just going to restart. And within a couple of minutes, bang, you've got your infrastructure management console back. And it's completely redundant. We have five here. If you lose access to this site, this is why we have five vCenters and five Zerto managers here. You can click and manage the whole thing. But the reason we have one Zerto manager for the management pod itself, and this is what you probably love, is it's to Zerto, Zerto. Just as you have a vCenter to manage vCenters. So what you'll do is you'll protect the four Zerto managers that are managing each of these pods from down here, and you'll replicate them within the same vCenter. So if there's a logical failure on any of these VMs where you need to rewind it back in time, you use Zerto, select the point in time, restore, and it will bring the VM, VMs online in this vCenter in just a couple of minutes. We're not going to replicate the Zerto managers to the DR site because that's pointless. If I lose this site here, I don't need my Zerto managers from production. Production's dead. And what it does also allow is for you to get Zerto back up and running and protect it from a physical failure of a host and the logical failure of the VM. And for us, because Zerto is continuously replicating and it sees all the changes in the virtual environment, the one thing it doesn't like is being restored from a backup. If it comes from a backup, if that's from two weeks ago, and you've gone and changed and done 500 vMotions and 400 storage vMotions and changed some Zerto configuration details, it's not going to like the fact that this site is now at a completely different point in time. So Zerto in Zerto and allowing you to rewind back in time is one of the best protectors of this type environment. And once you've deployed this, what does it then allow? Well, the maximum number of VMs that we support today is not actually a hard limitation. It's what we test to in our scale environment down in Israel. And that's actually 5,000 VMs between two Zerto managers, between two vCenters. So when you put Zerto on top of here, The maximum number of customers is 5,000. Split that out per cluster, it's 625. And so straight away, 
instead of it being an 8,000 VM maximum environment, it's now a 20,000 VM maximum environment. But I will say, theoretically, that represents 150% increase in the maximum number of customers that you can have now on this SaaS environment. But that's in theory, because if you roll back to what I said before, not all the customers have just one VM. 20% sometimes have two VMs, a couple a bit more, a couple a bit less. So if you factor in that 20%, Worst case scenario, it's an extra 100% utilization, double the number of customers. Best case scenario, 50%. Can you have multiple VRAs per cluster if you were in the ridiculousness of over 5,000? No, so it's one VRA per host in a cluster. Okay. And I'll be honest, this deployment now, it, so this environment is being deployed right now. It's all been tested in their labs in advance, done at scale. They actually tested it with 100 example customers, which is the most thorough POC I've ever seen in my history at Zerto. And I'm actually going to push for us to increase our own testing to match. Because that's literally how we work. As soon as someone starts getting close to our test limits, we'll up our test limits. The 5,000 is just a testing limit, right? It's not a technical limit somewhere. Well, if you read uh, some competitive documents, apparently if you try and protect the 5,000 and first VM, it blocks you, which is not true. It doesn't block you at all. It's, it's just what we tested. Exactly. Yeah, it's not a factor of two. It's unlikely to be the real limit. Yeah. <laughs> so what are the benefits that the uh, customer realized from this? They've now increased the capacity. They now have VM level consistency groupings, so they can have multiple customers within the same LUN. They've got RPOs in seconds with the continuous replication that we do, RTOs in minutes because we include all of the orchestration and automation. They also now have self-service capabilities. And there was one other requirement that they had as part of this, which is where I came in, where they also said, at this scale, yes, this Zerto interface is really good and I like it and it's simple, but we don't have the headcount and the time to sit there and protect these VMs one by one. And this is not just this customer. I hear this in a lot of large-scale environments. And it's one of the biggest trends in the industry right now is the culture of DevOps and automation. So they said, we also want to fully automate VM protection. So that's where I came in. And I said, let's talk. And let's get something working in your PSC to prove out how you do this so you can fully automate this and never touch the Zerto interface, which is what I'd like to share with you now. Mm. Are you ready? <coughs> Howard was our <coughs> shell for Zerto. So we'll just check my remote access, which is good. So there's a legal disclaimer and my disclaimer. I am a bit of a PowerShell nerd. I am hopelessly addicted to it, and I'm going to take you through I'm exactly how it works. I'm terribly sorry. I do know a rehab you could go to. <laughs> I'm, I love it so much. I don't want to go to rehab. You have to hit rock bottom first. <laughs> so the start of the script, we just give general disclaimer. This is an example. These are the requirements. And we have some variables as to what do I need to log into the Zerto Manager API? What do I need to log into the vCenter? Nice uh, secure password. And very secure password there. What I can tell you on the password is this is included in a new API automation document that we're releasing in the next couple of weeks. And there is a section on that that says, all these examples for simplicity, passwords in clear text. If you want to encrypt it, these are two excellent blog articles. It's very simple to do. So to walk you through this, we have a CSV where we actually just give a list of all of the different VPG settings. So target clusters, data stores. It could be data store clusters as well. What SLAs do you want to put around retention, the RPO settings, et cetera. So you can build out a set list of profiles and I did originally want to build this using vSphere tags because of the cool new thing. But I was really disappointed in VRO7 to not see any workflows for assigning vSphere tags. There's a tag workflow for tagging workflows, but none for tagging vSphere objects. I can do custom objects. And I thought we were supposed to move away from that. So I had to switch and use vSphere folders, which was actually the request of the customer anyway. <laughs> 
So what this does, just to talk you through what we built, and very clearly in the script it says everything below this you do not need to configure, but we've added comments throughout to explain how it works if you want to tweak it or just learn. So we start by getting some dates to then build a transcript. So if there's any error on execution, very easy to then troubleshoot. We're going to import the Power CLI commandlets, connect to the vCenter because we need to get the VMware folder information. We're then going to build and authenticate with the Zerto API. So this is all REST API driven from the Zerto manager interface. Then we need to build a list of all the VMs that we need to protect. And we're doing this by this specific vCenter folder name. So to show you what that looks like in my environment, so this is dialed into my lab at home. What we have is two folders. We've got protected VMs and VMs to protect. Pretty self-explanatory. But one cool extra thing is within this, we have two boot group folders. So if, for example, you want a database VM to come online in front of a web server, very important for this SaaS provider, depending on where you place these VMs will affect the boot order when you click to test or fail over the protection group. So we come back to the script. Once we've got the VMs and the respective boot group folders, assign that. We're going to put that into just a small array to query it later because we've got a list of all the VMs, but I want to know what VPGs there are to create. And that's actually taken from the VM name. So we go back. You can see here, we're selecting the unique VPG names. And the reason we're doing that is because we need to support the ability to have multiple VMs in a protection group. So I'm saying, this is a list of all the VMs in this folder. Give me the unique VPG names. And the VPG name is derived from everything before the hyphen. You can easily change where, how you derive that and come to that. But this is what the customer wanted. So in this example, we're going to have two protection groups created. Customer one with two VMs in two boot groups, and customer two with just one VM. Reasonably simple. And these are just dummy VMs, which, of course, everyone should use for the first run of this, so you don't have to wait an hour for it to sync the data. And we come back to the script where we're selecting the unique VPG names, and then we're going to do a for each VPG. And for each VPG, we're going to get the settings from the CSV that we specified at the start. And then we're going to use the Zerto APIs to get, based on the settings you defined, all of the identifiers we need for creating this protection group. So data store IDs, port group IDs, folder IDs, every different element that we need to then use in the REST API to automate the protection of this VM. So if we scroll down, the next thing we do is we build the JSON request. So I'll just come back. So in the JSON request, now we've got all these identifiers. We're just using these simple variables, building out the request in the exact format that the Zerto REST API is looking for. One slight little bit of uh, trickery I had to do is to support multiple VMs in a protection group, I had to do a for each loop within the JSON request to, so you could specify multiple VM IDs. And if it has an existing VM ID in there, then it says add the uh, comma in there to separate out the JSON request. A little bit tricky, but it works. So what you do at the end is we build the JSON request. So we put the main, the VMs, and the end just to close it off. We come down. And now we're going to post it via the REST API to Zerto. And we put it in a try and a catch. So if there is any issue with this, it's going to give you a meaningful exception in the transcript rather than just, I didn't work. Once it's done that, Zerto gives us a VPG settings identifier which you can then query and pull back and verify from Zerto what settings has it accepted. And then we need to commit it. So we built the URL, and we've now said, you've now got all the settings in your memory. We've confirmed that they're all there. Now I want you to go and create this protection group based on all the settings that we've gone for. And we're going to capture whether that passed or failed. And if it passed, and only if it passed, then we just do a very simple move VM, and we're going to change the folder. Move it only if it successfully created this protection group. Do I want you to move the VM from the folder to protect to protected? Then I want you to wait 
a predefined delay before you create the next protection group. You don't want to overload the Zerto manager. You don't want to throw, create 400 VPGs within a 20 second window, which the script can do. That's going to break not only Zerto, probably the vCenter behind it. So you can space them out. For this demo, I will do it a little bit quicker. And as soon as it's finished, the for each, which I tell you there, so end of pair VPG actions, just so you don't get lost later in the script. We disconnect from the vCenter and we stop the transcript. Pretty cool. So now for the really fun part. Do I dare click play? Absolutely. Let's go. So our transcript started. Connecting to the vCenter, I'm not ignoring the certificate, so you can see that there. Authenticating with the Zerto API. You can see it's just posted the JSON request there, so we've got a nice visual queue. And if we come across to Zerto, what can we see? Creating customer one virtual protection group. And if we go across to the VPG list, it has the two protected VMs in here. <laughs> And then if we go back to the script. It's always satisfying when the live demo works. Yes, very rare. Waiting 30 seconds before we create the, the next VPG. For the customer in question here, I said, you're probably best spacing it out a couple of minutes. And obviously not creating 5,000 protection groups at once. You're going to want to do this in batches. So they're going to uh, deploy this out in batches of around 50 protection groups simultaneously for each pod. Because it's a different Zerto manager, there's no reason you can't do 50 at a time and break it out. So now the script has uh, finished running. It's saying uh, it's finished there. Come back to the VPGs. And we also have customer two protection group. And because these are dummy VMs, these are going to sync reasonably fast. And then the final test that I just want to show you is if I go into the VM settings, you can also see. We've got the boot groups there, although I will say that I have made one slight mistake because it should be the other way around. You'd put the database first, but oh well, you get the picture. Now, the other requirement of the customer was not just running and automating the VM protection, was integrating that into VRO. Now, granted, we don't have a VRO plugin, but VRO is an extensible platform. So all they have to do is add the PowerShell host, add the PowerShell script here that you can run standalone or as part of your workflow, and then in their create VM workflow, all they've got to do is make sure on the last step they execute this script. It'll pull all those VMs out, create the protection groups, move them to the new folders, and that's it. Have you, have you turned that into an actual module yet for you guys to ship out with, instead of having to put all the invoke rest method or web request lines in there to do your own commandlets yet? Not yet, but potentially in the future. So the first step is just publishing the white paper, getting it out there, getting people using it and feedback, and then if it takes off, I, I don't see why not. Is there any protection against um, unprotected VMs? So is there any trigger showing us VMs aren't protected yet? Yes, so that is a, a use case I've heard a little bit actually, where in the Zerto REST API, there is an API call that we will give you just the unprotected VMs. So if you want to completely change this and just say protect everything that's not in a VPG, you can do that too. Yeah. So that is how Zerto is going to protect this SaaS provider. Uh, I said before, this is not in full production right now, but it is being deployed right now. And for me, it's really exciting just because <coughs> of the size and the scale. So one thing we will be doing as part of this is publishing this as a, a reference architecture for Zerto at scale, again, without any names. But we'll also be feeding that back through to the community to establish a basic guideline of best practices and design guidelines of Zerto in a large vSphere environment. 